So our friends over here just give us a little bit of mushroom tea. This is my buddy Oliver. What's up, Oliver? Hey guys. My co-producer. Hey. We built an RV together, and we're just traveling around doing documentaries. Nice, nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. So yeah, show us. Yeah, show us the Here's bonanza. But uh, we harvested all these yesterday. Yeah. And uh, try to figure this out. There we go. Um, nice but there's it's definitely some like purple. These purple ones here are the psilocybin. And these guys? Do you think oh. all of these are edible? No. Oh, no. No, okay. no. Well, give me your name again, man. Eric. Eric? Yeah. yeah. So appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, Eric gave us some mushroom tea. I, like, <laughs> I've been taking about an ounce of psilocybin mushrooms every month. For really? The past, like, four to five months. Wow. Well, that's what I want to yeah. ask you. How how does it fit into your lifestyle? Well, I was doing a lot more, and now I'm starting to stop. Because um, I had, like, a pretty tragic thing happen to me, and so I was, like, really depressed. Mm -hmm. And so they were helping me with that. Really? Um, yeah. I Do you me. mind sharing? Yeah, my dad passed away. Yeah, so that he, happened to me recently as yeah, well. Yeah, yep, and it was really tough. What, what kind of experience did you have that helped you with that healing? You know, I, I, the best way I've heard it described is it kind of erases all those grooves that have been ingrained in your brain for the way that you think about things and all that, and it kind mm -hmm. of gives you a new slate to kind of look at things differently. Yeah, and even if yeah. you go back to the old slate when the experience is over, yeah. you've seen what's possible. Yeah, I guess. Eyes. Yeah. We've been talking to a lot of people and have found this common thread of dealing with end of life, either yeah. with loved ones or your own fear of mortality. Mm. Did you think about your own mortality? Yeah, it helps you, you know, kind of not fear the reaper. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Do you share any of, you know, the opposition's concerns about just unleashing this onto the world without much education, without much understanding of what it does long term? Well, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I uh, am for almost anything that grows naturally. Yeah. If you can consume it. Yeah. When, when you get, you know, the pharmaceutical companies involved and, and they're going to start doing things to it that you don't, mm -hmm. you know, may not want, you know, so that's the scary part. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks Thank for you showing guys. us awesome. all that. Yeah. yeah, you guys should definitely go find some because they're everywhere. Okay, yeah, we <laughs> might get into it. And thanks for the primo spot, as yeah, you said. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> Yeah, and then you can use these for art too. So all together, this is about two and a half eighths. They grind them down in a grinder and then they just put them in these capsules. Away we go. Ah, 14 at once. It's a skill. My name's Devin Green. I'm a comedian from Baltimore, Maryland that moved out to Los Angeles six years ago. My name is Oliver Tang. I'm a comedian who moved to Los Angeles from Santa Maria, California six years ago. We started making videos under the banner of Team Friendship, covering a wide span of genres, from sketch comedy to promo videos to mini documentaries. Van life, RV life, minimalism, glorified homelessness. One by one here, insulation and then a one by one here. Cheers, my friend. Cheers. All right, since we left the man tribe and finished our month of ice, um, a lot's happened, right? All right, Oliver, you asked for community. Drove up to Seattle, Washington to document, do some interviews at Chaz. You pulled your gun like 15 times. No, I haven't! 
So we're sure that's gunshots? They're pretty sure. Now we're next to these pointless colored rocks in the middle of nowhere. And that's kind of how Area 51 felt, yeah? If everyone were to run past those gates, what would happen? They go to jail. I feel about how I would expect to feel after sleeping in the shotgun seat of a car. Self-help me, the show where I self-help you, self-help yourself. We're covering the play. It's awareness by Tony DeMello. Why is this the news? This is why is this the news? Why is this the news? Bono. You fat. Oh, come on now. Let's see what the infinite assassin has to say about that. You came into my ring. You're gonna taste my blood. Today we'll be filing our text. Let's get sad. Oh yeah, you got a flute. Go ahead and join us. Routine friendship. We go with the flow. The story finds us. We don't find the story. And that's when Oliver and Devin met Kevin and his merry band. Kevin Matthews. Kevin was the Matthews. campaign Kevin Matthews director the campaign of the campaign for Denver. The leaders behind Matthews. Initiative 301. To coast. That's the most important part to this is that education. We can't control what people do, but at the very least we can provide like the education, we can provide the resources, we can provide kind of the, the general framework for how to do this. Our biggest thing with, with um, and law enforcement in Denver is getting their officers trained on trauma-informed care and harm reduction techniques. Yeah. Because we have 50% of our inmates in Denver have behavioral health issues, and they're not getting the services they need. Free the sports! Free the sports! Free the sports! We're here on the steps of the city and county building. Let Denver hear your voice. <laughs> It could be the start of Denver giving a pass to another drug. Kevin Matthews organized Decriminalize Denver, which managed to get 9,428 petition signatures. This is very simply to allow individuals to use, possess, and propagate a naturally occurring substance without facing criminal penalties in Denver. According to the ballot language, decriminalization will go into effect as soon as the election results are certified on May 16th. Police would then treat these mushrooms as their lowest priority and no city money or resources would be allowed to be used to impose criminal penalties. They have the choice now to not be criminalized for actually cultivating it at home. Our mission is to transform public opinion to normalize and decriminalize the responsible use, possession, and cultivation of psilocybin mushrooms and also other psychedelic plants and fungi. So we have a film crew here today, everyone. So, yeah. so we're hoping that we can cover some of this as it develops here in Los Angeles, where we're from, Oakland. We're talking to Jeff Hunt, who's the opposition leader. We've talked to the news over at ABC7. We're talking to you guys. You know, my dad was an old school journalist in the first counterculture revolution, lived with John Lennon, you know, covered the Martin Luther King shooting. Yeah. So that's my ideal, which is to tell the story as it is and to really do a fair assessment of what's happening here. Where I was able to experience psychedelics four years ago in a therapeutic experience where I actually had somebody sitting for me and also had the experience of releasing trauma in some of those experiences, especially with psilocybin. The download was so insane and I just was like, I have to do this for my life. We have a duty to, to steward what is sacred period life. And to me, mushrooms for me, they connect me to this, to like our mother and our, and our, our family. My parents are actually really supportive because they saw me, they saw me go through a lot. And my mother actually told me that she's really happy I found mushrooms because she can tell I sound better just on the phone. So it's pretty awesome, but it's me. I'm going to begin introducing that I'm doing this with the hospital and my physician group. Um, and I may be fired, you know? The more that I can, um, we all can have a legitimate term that can be referenced as having value from like the establishment perspective, then the more this is going to take on an air of like elegance rather than I am simply an activist, which people would poo poo in a professional setting. To me, one of the most important pieces for our work as advocates is that we destigmatize psilocybin and psychedelics and that we take information to the medical and psychological community so that even if they never use psychedelics themselves, they can um, help their clients and their patients who might use psychedelics 
and be able to integrate those experiences into their protocols for healing. Every individual has a right to choose their own way to heal. Integration therapy. So it's how do we take the trauma that they've experienced, how do we take their life experiences, and then how do we take the psychedelic experience and begin to integrate that. Psychedelics aren't for everyone. There's still going to be a population of those people where even psychedelics don't work. But when somebody is feeling like they have tried every single treatment possible, then the research is showing that psilocybin, um, ketamine, uh, there's some cannabis research being done that, that actually supports people in their healing processes. My name is Lindsay. I am a registered nurse. I've been working in, in emergency rooms and trauma centers for about eight years. My husband was a veteran of the U.S. Army. Um, he was a field artillery, uh, 13 Foxtrot, and he deployed to Iraq and deployed to Afghanistan and um, came back with a post-traumatic stress diagnosis. He sought mental health care and was told he had to drive two and a half hours to go to another clinic because their clinic was full. And so dealing with his mental illness, um, he was unable to find the you know, emotional resources to really make that kind of a commute. We relocated about two years later to Las Vegas. He sought treatment there. Um, he was seen by a psychiatrist for about 20 minutes and was put on four different medications. Um, I felt as a nurse and as someone who's dealt with mental health issues, I knew that was pretty dangerous to put someone on four different psychotropic medications after one appointment. So I kind of assumed the role of caregiver for him. I was trying to manage his medications, um, but ultimately um, he chose to self-medicate with alcohol quite a bit. So that became a pretty, pretty dark path. After, you know, attending maybe one or two therapy appointments, he decided to get off all of his medication and then within a year he had uh, committed suicide. This is a national emergency. Um, this mental health and addiction crisis, it's destroying our country from the inside out. It's not a great time to teach someone to swim when they're drowning. We need effective alternative interventions to treat these issues that we're facing as a country um, because, the, because what we have isn't working right now. People are beginning to realize that we need a shift in the way we address mental health care. I suffered from depression for a long time and traditional antidepressants just didn't work. Um, for me, they pretty much muted out my experience of life. When I, I wasn't experiencing the highs or the lows, it was just all, all pretty neutral. And that didn't feel like a good place to be because I wasn't feeling joy, even though I wasn't feeling pain. I knew I needed relief immediately and pharmaceuticals had not given me what I knew I needed. In my attempt to find lasting healing, I reached out to some friends and they got me into connection with psilocybin mushrooms and um, it profoundly changed my life pretty much overnight, um, changed a lot of things for me. Psilocybin has the potential to directly address um, the opiate crisis and directly address the mental health crisis that we're facing as a country. Psychedelics and psilocybin specifically just like removed all those lenses and allowed me to really see the world for what it truly is without my backstory, without my kind of damage or baggage kind of, um, you know, skewing the way I perceive things. We don't have any stories of anyone being destroyed by psilocybin. It's, it, there's been 40 years in the making of this. We have the whole 60s culture. Those people went out and had their lives and had families and moved on. We have beautiful stories about that. That's why I'm an advocate. It's awesome. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Love it. All right. What a fun conversation. Okay. It's important for me to get my message out. So thank you for interviewing me. legalization of, of mushrooms or just anything that is powerful right yeah it's powerful just like any 
powerful prescription drug. So it's more of a matter of how do we use this item? How do we integrate this into our lives so that it's positive? So we have all of these regulations for driving, for flying, for travel, for laws, all over the place. So there's no reason that we can't find that balance between letting ourselves be free and making sure that we're safe so that we have even more freedom and more fun and we share with everyone. Mm -hmm. And so once again, it's positive for everybody. So I don't necessarily think that it's too powerful. I think it's just a matter of the due diligence for us to take care of ourselves and say, hey, we've got something new and this is how you do it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And if we come together and protect each other, it won't be a problem. So we're releasing psychedelics. When you released the Funkadelic, that's how you felt. I'm third generation. <laughs> so I grew up in, in Georgia, my grandfather. So uh, I think I'm, oh, yeah, I'm the oldest grandson on stage. So for me, it was just like, bam, there you are. Yep. So as far as craziness, it's always been my yep. life. Most people don't know, I actually am the most sober person on that stage. Yep. So it's just a matter of when you when you increase that love and you increase that positivity, right? You can have as much fun as you want. You know, and you'll never overload. Uh, thank you, God's Be weapon. Well. God's weapon. Keep the Clinton name alive. Yeah. The other one got kind of got kind of ruined. Denver's pretty laid back in general. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, well, heck, we just decriminalized mushrooms. So, yeah, it's laid back. <laughs> How much more laid back can you get? <laughs> I was in the mountains today, and there was a, there was a little uh, storefront. It was like, guns, liquor, pot. <laughs> I was like, okay. My name's Jacob Curtis. I'm a photographer, photojournalist here at Denver 7. It's the ABC affiliate in Denver, Colorado. I've been covering the decriminalized Denver or the Denver Psilocybin Initiative since the inception, um, really. Colorado is a progressive state when it comes to drug policy. Colorado was the first state to legalize recreational marijuana, along with Washington at the same time. The first day of legal marijuana sales in Colorado. Take a look at this crowd in Denver, braving the snow to wait for their turn to step inside and buy weed right out in the open, just like alcohol. The drug war is sort of winding down. If you, I mean, that's my opinion. Denver voters voted to decriminalize psilocybin mushrooms, which was, I guess it was surprised some people. Uh, surprised me. Very, it was a very close vote. 50.6, I think. It was under 2,000 vote difference. And it really became a story that the mainstream media picked up on in January of 2019 when they, the campaign sent their petitions into the uh, Denver elections to get on the ballot. If you, could, if you could be, you know, somebody who's been talking about the issue before the, um, the weed legalization movement happened, before this, yeah. and after, and how hard it is to kind of separate everything out and figure out you know, the best way to proceed, right. that would be great. Sure, I'll talk to you. My name is Tom Muston. I'm a news anchor and reporter here at Denver 7 KMGH. I've been in the business since 96. What is that? 20 something years, yeah. As a reporter, you know, before Sanjay Gupta had a report on CNN about the legalization of marijuana and said, I've changed my mind on this right. issue. It would be very rare for a news anchor to come into your home uh, at seven or 10 o'clock at night and say, today we're talking about mushrooms. Right. Remember the 60s? Yeah. How it, weird was that? It, it was very weird because all of a sudden we go from, you know, three, four years ago, not talking about pot and that, that being the forefront. And all of a sudden we are leading newscasts talking about psilocybin. So <laughs> it is, it's a different world now, but it's, it's reality. And that's what we're facing now. And, and there are enough people out there that think there are some benefits to legalizing psilocybin. So we treat it as a news story, just like we treat everything else. Now. Are you a parent? I am. Yeah, I have three kids. It's a little more complicated now than it was, right? Yes. When you have the pot talk, you say, well, maybe you can try it, but wait until you're older, yeah. don't get addicted to it. For younger people with smaller bodies, using drugs is not safe or healthy. Is it healthy for you to do it? Well, it wouldn't be healthy if I did it all the time. 
you know, our kids are getting exposed to this, so it's better to have the conversation, you know, sooner than later. Do I have all the answers? Certainly not, but it's certainly worth bringing up as a conversation because it is a part of our lives now and it will be going forward. I think that's all I got. Thank cool, you. man. Appreciate it. All right, my, my pleasure. Nice to meet you guys. So you think if we just let the cat out of the bag completely, it wouldn't be the end of society as we know it? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, you're going to have unintended consequences and negative things happening whenever you introduce something that's new and potentially dangerous. You know, we have mass shootings nowadays and people have easy access to guns. Um, you can't do a mass shooting with a mushroom. <laughs> well, when you look at the benefits that have come from legalization of weed. I think there are a lot of people who are saying if this happens, this is going to become the crime capital of the world. The, the opposition has their points and some of them are valid. Really the, the main opposition was Jeff Hunt. Jeff Hunt helps run a public policy think tank at Colorado Christian University. The fact is we just don't know a lot about these psychedelic mushrooms and the impact it's going to have on people's brains. He was the main voice in opposition to the decriminalization movement. Yeah, it sounds like we're going to have to talk to the opposition. Yeah. Jeff Hunt. My name is Jeff Hunt. I serve as the director of the Centennial Institute. The Centennial Institute's the conservative think tank housed at Colorado Christian University. And we got involved in this really in light of the larger drug commercialization movement that's taking place. And so we saw the decriminalization of psychedelic mushrooms or psilocybin as a continuation of this larger movement to commercialize drugs, which is going to have uh, very harmful effects on our uh, on young people, but on our culture broadly. I've got sort of a fantasy about uh, getting you and Kevin to talk. Oh, yeah, I've never actually had a conversation with him. We, we kind of found ourselves to be like the only voice against this stuff. One of the main arguments was this commercialization aspect. If you look at our local weekly magazines, they're covered with marijuana ads. The reason we're opposed to it is not because we're opposed to decriminalization. We're opposed to commercialization of these drugs. Got it. They have a financial incentive to get as many people using these as they possibly can. We've done this with drugs over and over and over again in our society. In the 1800s, if you wanted to smoke a cigarette, you had to grow your own tobacco, you had to dry your own tobacco, you had to roll your own tobacco. And it wasn't until about the early 1910s, 1920s, that you had tobacco companies putting it into packs of 20, lacing it with nicotine, with a financial incentive to get as many people using it as possible. 40 years of tobacco infiltrating every aspect of our society. You've all seen the Lucky Strike ads. Light up a lucky, it's light up time. Be happy, go lucky, it's light up time. Best tasting cigarette you ever smoked. Light up a lucky strike. Get lucky. Light up a lucky right now. L-S-M-F-T. Lucky strike means fine tobacco. Once you start getting that taste, you'll want to keep getting it. You'll say it's the best tasting cigarette you ever smoked. Smoke, smoke, smoke. Now we've educated people and pretty much everybody understands what the secondhand effects are. But that took nearly a hundred years. Look at the opioid industry. Opioid starts with doctors saying pain is a vital sign that needs to be treated. So they start going out there and saying, you as a doctor have a responsibility to treat the pain of your patients. And if your patients are in pain, you're not doing a good job as a doctor. Opioids are non-addictive. That's what they said initially. You know, this happens in the early 90s. So for about 20 years, you get doctors per over prescribing opioids, people getting addicted on it. They then roll it back, but people still need opioids. They start to go to heroin. And we have a massive death problem in this country of drug overdose because the proper education was not done. So when I look at marijuana and psilocybin, I go, okay, you guys want to bring these to market. You want people to be able to consume these. Well, first they, they make the argument that there's a medicinal side of this. 
I think psilocybin should be looked upon as a nootropic vitamin. Johns Hopkins University, as you probably well know, uh, New York University, UCLA, elsewhere in Europe, there's major clinical studies that have been conducted in the past two years showing exactly what I'm saying about overcoming fear response, neurogenesis, overcoming PTSD. This is now medically uh, quite seriously considered. There's, there's over 20 years of clinical research now. Um, and from those clinical studies, mushrooms have been demonstrated to have an incredible medical potential to treat things like depression and anxiety, addiction to things like alcohol and tobacco. So you run out there with these outlandish medical claims that haven't been properly vetted through the FDA. You know, I think that they have sort of put compliance very high on their list of responsibility. They're trying to follow the rules and regulations to a T. Without decriminalization, would it be possible to go through FDA channels? Or would that have to be a step one? No, and that's a serious problem. You're exactly right. There should be options for researchers to really dive in and understand these. On the flip side, it's amazing to me how much the industry won't accept the results from the FDA. The Journal of the American Medical Association just the other day tweeted out that a vast majority of what is claimed cannabis can do is not supported by research. I think if you want the FDA to do their research, you've got to respect what comes out of that. And that's true for us too. So if we feel like there's stuff that comes out of this research that says there is a benefit to psilocybin for the use of this particular disease, we accept it and go, okay. And if they come out and say there are long-term mental health problems with psilocybin, then the industry needs to recognize that too. But you're not seeing that. You can't keep using psilocybin every day. It can't, it, the body doesn't have an addictive quality to it. It's not a drug of abuse. It's not a, a drug that causes, you know, addictions, addictions or withdrawal symptoms or anything like that. This is, this is a, this is a safe, completely natural organism that is picked directly out of the ground and ingested on its own. Have you guys, uh, taken mushrooms yet? Are you going to for part of this? Yeah. Part of this experiment is for us to not only take mushrooms, but also do some of the psychotherapy that's associated with after the experience. So yeah, I mean- Have, it, I have you done it yet? Uh, I've done it before. <laughs> yeah, what was your experience like? Um, my personal experience? Yeah. Well, I've had a few, generally positive, very euphoric. Part of it was dealing with my grandma passing. She had a heart attack about two years ago. I'm sorry to hear that. I did the mushrooms a couple months after she had her heart attack when we kind of knew that it was going to be her time to, uh, to pass on. The idea of mortality became very real in that moment. And there was like maybe two or three hours of just really understanding what that means to not exist anymore, mm -hmm. you know? And then right after that, it was this euphoria, like, no, that's, that's what makes life so good, mm -hmm. you know, that it can all end. So you kind of process through almost on a kind of philosophical or spiritual level through it. Because yeah. marijuana is interesting because some people just tank out, right? Or with alcohol too. Marijuana, you kind of just drift to a different area. And I, I always got, I got paranoid a lot when I did marijuana. Yeah, the comparison I like to make is, you've seen the studies on what a near-death experience can do to yeah. someone's life. Yeah. A single event can make mortality so real yeah. that all of a sudden the way you look at a rose or see a sunset or look at your son is different. The last time I did it, I was uh, thinking about my dad who passed away. And then I went up on a little journey on my own and you know, the trees are bright. Um, they're sort of spiraling with life. You get a feeling that life is pervasive around you. It's not just dead trees and human beings. It was as though my brain were creating a waking dream oh. in order to give me the lesson of feel the vibrancy of life and then recognize that, you know, it will go gray and your mortality will happen. And I just remember laughing and going, you know, thank you to the universe almost wow. of like, thank you for making that real to me. Wow. And interesting. Oh, You like mushrooms? Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I like micro all the time. Really? I've been recording you, so. Hi. <laughs> Team Friendship for Life. I'm grateful for your van. I'm grateful for your videos. Oh, and yeah. I'm grateful for shrooms. Yeah. Oh, yes.
one fan at a time. <laughs> right, he was so people. cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got another one coming up. You guys, hey guys know about Team Friendship? So they're close. Do you know, wait, wait. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> but subscribe! Now let's try and find some food. Dude, we might be like out of luck. I don't know. Taco Bell? It's Taco Bell 24. Will it make it? Yeah, you're good. You guys road tripping that? Yeah, we're road tripping from Los Angeles. I'm from LA too. Hell yeah. Is that a vape? You better be clean, man. I'm super clean. All right, man. I just brushed my teeth at a 24 hour fitness. <laughs> oh, let's go. I'm great. But you can't get legal out here. No. We're doing a documentary on it, actually. Oh, sick. Yeah. Oh. Is this a documentary? Yeah. Oh, are you ordering? Uh, let me do a Crunchwrap Supreme and a Power Menu Bowl. Is this the first RV you've seen in the drive-thru? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Good luck, guys. Team Friendship for life. Woo! Yeah. 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 They forgot your Cinestics. You're going back? Yeah. No Cinestic left behind. We're Team Friendship. <laughs> Here you go. Thank you. From August 14th until the 18th is the 39th annual Telluride Mush Mushroom Festival. And um, it's not necessarily exclusively focused on psychedelic mushrooms, but there is an accepting culture there of psychedelic mushrooms. There will be several like talks being given about um, psychedelics in treatment for drug addiction, neurological Ill illnesses or fatigue syndrome, things like that. And so we just wanted to go to this festival and kind of show our face in this community and just connect with other people that are, you know, my co-enthusiasts, I guess. Do you know the Mushroom Man? He lives in Telluride. What's up, man? Are you hey, man. Mushroom Man? I'm into it, man. <laughs> What's your name? Stone. Stone? Yeah. Birth given name or? Birth given. Wow, okay, so is it safe to assume that your parents were hippies? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell us your name. I'm Bob. Bob, yeah. What's your name? Katie. Katie? I'm Devin. Good hey, to Devin. meet you. First of all, what is this? <laughs> Don't ask too many questions. <laughs> what do you think the best thing mushrooms can do for an individual? <laughs> Understood. Yeah. All right, thank you guys for your time. I bought the first bag of pot in uh, San Miguel County when I was county commissioner. <laughs> and what's your story, sir? Um, I've been coming here since 2005. Um, I love mushrooms. Uh, they're pretty much uh, a solution to every problem. It was uh, <laughs> quoted by Gary Linkoff. Every problem. <laughs> every problem. One of the lectures that we listened to yesterday was about how they had used psychedelics to cure people who had cocaine addiction. Like a control, alt, delete, like a reset of your uh, cerebral cortex. There's some kind of neurotransmitter theory behind that. Small doses can have a larger effect. And indigenous people knew this. It wasn't about doing more. The, the problem we get in American society is we just always want more and more. So mm -hmm. I see that as the biggest danger is. But that's from the people misusing the substance, not the substance itself. It's always beneficial, mm -hmm. you know? And I always take it with cacao. Really? Yeah, I feel like it grounds you and gives you a base to walk into the light. I love cacao. First of all, let's get Tyler's... Uh, Travis. Tra is Ta Travis Tyler? I have three names. Travis, Travis Tyler Flood. Given that I've uh, been taking psilocybin for 25 years now, I feel very guided or intuitively pushed in certain directions, and I correlate that to the psilocybin. Travis did seven and a half of these super powerful ones, which is the equivalent of 10, Yeah. which is like unheard of. He said it was the best thing for him. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. It opens your heart, it opens your mind, and once that has occurred, you are now operating through gratitude, through connection, through, you know, uh, treating resources with reverence. If mushrooms are legalized, that 
I think you'll overall have a more of a sense of oneness in this country, which we don't have at all right now. Can you hold my rabbit mask? I would love to hold your rabbit mask. That's going to be on stage later. My name is Trad Cotter. I own Mushroom Mountain. I'm one of the speakers talking about mushroom research and we also opened up a um, psilocybin research center in Jamaica and we're looking at maybe even moving to Costa Rica, you know. It's our responsibility to take this knowledge and to do something with it, all right? We have to change this place, all right? We have to be activists. You gotta go back and you have to vote. You gotta do this stuff. We have peace and love. You know we're gonna have happiness. It's a strong group. And that's around a lot of what the talks are based around. And what I'm going to be talking about is community, you know? This is community. We talked to Jeff Hunt, and his claim was, uh, number one, that if we legalized, it would be like the tobacco companies. They would take over, market mushrooms, put extra things in it, it would be dangerous. Right. They used the avenue of medicine to get started. But the end goal with all of these is about money, and, and financial success. There's companies like Compass and there's pharmaceutical companies that are pushing for the legalization of synthetic psilocybin. You know, what good is a medicine if you can't afford it? So, yeah, you do have a business, but you know, if you have an avenue, of, um, an outlet for people to come to and have that experience or even teach them how to grow mushrooms themselves, right? When it becomes decriminalized or, you know, it's the most cultivated mushroom in the world. It's easy. Riley Caps, I'm the drugs reporter for Rooster Magazine. I started to cover what's next after cannabis, and just talking to people, they started to um, say mushrooms were next. So I started just reporting on all of the people that were saying that mushrooms are the next frontier in drug policy reform. Because there was a lot of things that could have happened. We could have decriminalized all drugs. His shirt says, Cops say legalize heroin. Are you nuts? I don't think so. Mushrooms were just the thing that caught the most people's imaginations because the most people have done them. They understand that they're not that dangerous. They've had a good time on it. So it's a very common experience that people are willing to like take a step into and say not just cannabis should be legal, but this other safe, natural living thing. And this is nothing new. I mean, people have been doing mushrooms and advocating for decriminalization since the 1960s, right? How would you define a drug? A drug to me is anything that changes your consciousness in any way. Okay. Coffee, uh, no, let me, that's not even right. A drug is any, I don't know. <laughs> it's a tough question, right? I mean, you know I what mean, it, eating lettuce could be a drug if it changes your consciousness. I think what you're getting at is like this question of language. Like, because people try to finesse the language and they try to be like, they're not drugs, they're medicines. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, they are, but yeah. they're also drugs, Yeah. right? Uh, Westerners discovered them in 1957 when Gordon Wasson went down and met with Maria Sabina, who was the famous curandera um, down in Oaxaca. The Harvard Psilocybin Project was one of the biggest and most famous. And they were started to see great results from people. And then people started to do too much.
they got too high in music festivals <laughs> and freaked out. And so you can have all this data that these things are good, but if people are losing their minds and rolling around in the mud, that just doesn't look that good to people that get up every morning and go to the factory and think everyone else should. Most of the people doing these drugs were quote unquote hippies too. It was a demographic issue, wasn't it? There were young people that already had an anti-establishment bent, that they were against these things like business and war. If you come out against those things and you say that we should all love each other and live off the land, I mean, it's legitimately threatening and we shouldn't minimize like, if everybody just stopped working, like, that's not a, like, we wouldn't survive. Life does not stop and start you know, at your convenience, you I, miserable uh, piece of shit. I mean, people would tell me, like, I got spun. You know, you guys know what spinning, getting spun means? Like getting yeah. the spins or just no, having like, a bad trip? No, it means, like, you take so many that you, f you get weird. Because mushrooms are extremely strange. And so they put you in touch with a part of nature that you don't normally see. And some people conceptualize that in different ways. Like, it's God, it's aliens, it's a computer simulation. And so they start like walking around being like, guys, you know we're in a computer simulation. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I don't know that, I don't think you know that. But they will, that's what it means to get spun. Well, what's interesting is that uh, Travis, who we spoke to, you might make the case he's been a little spun, right? The way you described it is the mushroom is literally bringing this knowledge into you and using you as a host to, yeah, to, to attain it. and express the consciousness that it has. I think everybody's looking for an authority to come down and say, we know what the benefits are and we know what the risks are. And when I've talked to some people out here, you know, the, the person who gave us mushroom tea said, it's from the earth, so I trust it. I uh, am for almost anything that grows naturally. Yeah. If you can consume it. Where's the authority come from, coming from to say these are indeed as safe as we claim and as beneficial? Where's the authority come from? And yeah. people do want that authority, don't they? Yeah. They want like a nutrition label <laughs> on mushrooms that says it will bring you this much enlightenment, this much creativity, and this much uh, craziness. Yeah. And that just doesn't exist. You don't think there's a way to say for sure that this is what you can expect from this? Mm, not really. I mean, what would society be like if we didn't have alcohol? It would be better in some ways, it would be worse in other ways. People wouldn't have as much fun out at weddings, but they also wouldn't have as much cirrhosis of the liver. Is alcohol good or bad? To say like mushrooms are good or bad, or, or I, I think you can't say that now, and I'm not sure you'll ever be able to say that. We may like give it to thousands and millions of people, and my belief is that it'll put them more in touch with nature and themselves, but it may also separate them from the desire to work it's hard or the desire to pursue material gains is hard that may affect our economy and so we may never be able to say this was a good move or a bad move we may, may never ever say that documentary and we're gonna have our own experience on Sunday but I wonder if you guys have any advice for us um, okay and Mushroom, like taking them taking them I don't like anything around me man-made so even money in my pocket driving a car you know mm. so it's best just that's why the skin of a drum your bare feet on the, the soil and I think that's where tree hugging comes from because it all kind of just you know envelops out of yeah the so just a feedback off that it's, it's, it's a very spiritual experience and you will find, this is my personal experience, um, you will find that you will have a shift in perspective and it will really make you feel one with, with your surroundings. You will have that total, you know, feeling of being one with like, you know, everything around you. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. When you can find that, that's a good thing. <laughs> I'm gonna ride in the parade yeah. right here, but. Oh, thanks, Cheers, appreciate guys. talking to you. Yeah. How dangerous can it be if he can do that, you know? <laughs> That's only one wheel. I can't do that. I can't do that. No matter where, what difficult space you may find yourself in, you may not, just breathe through it. Okay. Surrendering to it is the trick. Just trust it. Just trust it. It's not, it's not there to hurt you. It's there to hurt you. Just trust that. 
One love. <laughs> One love. <laughs> Would you like to share about your experience? What did you feel like going into it? What was your intention? Did you do ritual? What did that feel like? Well, we started in what we tried to make is the most judgment-free, loving, possible scenario that we could be in. setting is on point. We've got ginger tea, we had a good breakfast, and we're all good friends. We each sat around and kind of just explained our intention, and the intention that came to me was I've always felt really uncomfortable receiving compliments, and uh, I kind of just wanted to get to the root of that. My intention was to let go of my fear of disappointing others. and. On the second note, I kind of want to talk to my dad, who passed away five years ago. He was the biggest figure in the world in our lives. In the off chance that I could get some closure there, it's weird not to be able to, to call and ask for advice. He had always been someone who was fearless, and he had always had my back when I was growing up. And then we started to become at odds when I started to try to find myself. For him, I had to be a certain way to deserve his love. Then we took the mushrooms. This is about two and a half eighths. Yeah, you want to start with the chocolate? What's in there? It said like one gram. Okay. Good chocolate. Does it taste like mushrooms? Not even a little bit. <laughs> might just be chocolate. It might be. Okay. Oh my god. I'm starting to feel it. Okay. No. <laughs> The kids have changed the game. They grind them down in a grinder, and then they just put them in these capsules. And I remember the first moment that the experience started for me was I laid on my back, and I just started watching the clouds. Yeah, I'm looking at the clouds, and I think when people think of mushrooms, the first thing they think of is visual hallucinations. The first thing you notice is something you've looked at a thousand times, like clouds, seems to be breathing and kind of maybe morphing along the edges and you seem to see more. I felt like I had put a new lens on my camera and it, it felt like my eyes had been upgraded in that way. Yeah, and there's a weird symmetry that the things of nature take hold. That's one of the cool things about Trooper with somebody too. You go, am I seeing this? Yeah. <laughs> and I go, yeah, me too. And you're like, okay, so it's not just me. It's yeah. not just a made up, you know, thing in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that I started to feel was euphoria. It kind of felt like as a little kid again, we had nowhere to go. It was just, let's just have fun, you know? <laughs> What's his name? I keep forgetting. Mogwai. Mogwai. Mogwai from The Last Mohicans, which is the movie that made me believe in love. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's no way so long. The actor who plays this, who plays like every Native American in any movie, he's just like the one guy. <laughs> is so good. And there are moments in the scene. Wait, where did you get the shirt? Yeah. <laughs> I ordered it offline purposely. It took weeks to find it. And I was, I was engaging with this idea of myself as someone who's okay getting down in the dirt. So I took my shoes off and I was barefoot the entire time. When we decided to go for a walk, I started to feel very insecure. 
Devin Green in his new favorite pants ever. These are my favorite pants. I haven't had an emotional reaction to pants in a long time. They always got my back. Like Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver, you are now equivalent to Devin's favorite pants. You can take them anywhere. It's great. Is that insecurity that you started feeling there similar to the insecurity that your intention was around? I first thought of my mom, and I kind of thought, God, what would she think if she knew I was just out here doing mushrooms? And then I kept kind of just picturing her seeing me in this state and feeling really embarrassed. That lasted until we finally decided to go on the walk. I'm actually feeling very drawn to this. <laughs> you know what area I was drawn to yesterday? Yeah. This area. Because of the pass. We should check out this area and then this area. I got really, really quiet on that part. I think it might have just been the sheer awe of the beauty around me. The way the sun was kind of hitting us, it felt very much like a dreamy animated movie. What about the fear that, like, if we let ourselves be, we're not gonna do our jobs. <laughs> we're just gonna be out here. That's what Kyle sees always does. Oh, did you ask before you did that? <laughs> I don't think it would have said yes. <laughs> I wish I could be one of those prostitutes who works with like the the Stephen Hawking's. You know what I mean? Around the chair and just like gives them a little hand job. I think that's so beautiful. I might give a guy a hand job if it's that situation. It's not that you can't see this sober, but you see it, and you remember it a little more. And then I did have a true hallucination where we all stopped and I put my hand on this tree next to me. When I looked back at my hand, it had sort of become the bark and I really felt like I was attached to this tree. And then there was this moment where I really just the only way I can kind of explain it is I just thought about everything all at the same time. Like I thought about everything around me, I thought about everybody I'd known, I thought about this past couple weeks, my whole time I've spent living in LA, all the way to mortality and death and new birth, like just everything all at once. arrived at this lake and I just sat down and had this amazing view and I just started crying. Tears were really just coming out, I couldn't get them to stop. But I didn't feel insecure, it felt like healing tears, like this, was, this might have been a sadness that I had just kept down for so long. I started to really think about a breakup that I'd went through two years ago. I really felt this extreme abandonment from them. And then it was also thinking about my, my grandma who passed away this year. This was the first time I'd cried about it. I'll see you soon. Stay well. See you next time. You know, I was just there in this feeling of loss and and then I felt like I was receiving this message from the trees. And it was two things. One thing was that I'd never felt old until that moment. And then suddenly in that moment, it was like, you're a, you're a man at this point. And I'd never really, I never internalized it like that. And the second one was, I was told that I have a purpose. And that sort of stopped the tears. Yeah, you know, I, I always had believed that, but I never 
really believed it, you know? <laughs> it really was, was real in that moment. Everybody split up while I was looking at the lake and I went on my own. This experience, the quality of it, the slowness, the awareness is brought to you by <laughs> this. A shrimp unicorn. It's not on the market yet, I'm not supposed to tell you about this. But obviously that's the direction things are going in. Bite the unicorn. Finally look at your backyard. There's dust on that one. And I started recording first a fallen tree. This dead tree was covered in soft mulch around it. There were pine cones lining the sides of it. I thought maybe a squirrel had done it. I just noticed all this activity around this death. And so I started going through a mental dialogue, which I was saying out loud, you know, look at what death creates. It creates so much life. And I'd understood that intellectually, but I kind of felt like I was gathering evidence. I just want to see what's going on. And then I went further off on my own. And the first thing I noticed was a flower out and off in the distance. It's like a pretty lady at the bar. I don't want to approach. She must have a million people talking to her. But where are they? Let's get a little closer. Let's ask her for a dance. And I went over to it and I started talking to it like a woman. Hey. I sit here? Wow. This whole forest, you're the prettiest thing I've seen. Has anyone told you that? I feel like I'm objectifying nature a little bit. And then I told the flower I had to go look at another dead tree because I like looking at dead stuff. I gotta go. I gotta go explore this tree. the prettiest flower in this forest. And then I started noticing how looking through the camera allowed me to see more. Rather than being an obstacle to presence, which I was afraid it was going to be, it was another tool to play with. And then for the first time ever, I noticed AVCHD. AVCHD, this is the first codec that I used in the Sony my dad gave me for Christmas. It's so good at Christmas. Dad? Mm hmm? What? What? Do you have a black tape? Uh. Good evening, my name is Watson. I come this to the great Sherlock Holmes. Bye, too much for the time. I must go meet Holmes now. Will you be joining me? AVCHD was a new codec when I had gotten my first camera, which my dad had given to me. And I had completely forgotten this. And he had given me this camera and this note that said, you're gonna do great things with this camera. And that was the first time I'd started shooting videos. And that actually continued throughout community college and then college and up to now. Die, beast! You're mine! I felt in that moment an intense appreciation of everything around me. And everything had a character to it. And I felt like it was a friend. Then I went on this journey just walking around, uh, sort of photographing stuff and, and talking to everything I encountered and saying, oh, look at you, you do this. Thank you, like that's really cool. And then 
I found a box in the middle of the woods. And it was full of notes and sort of random trinkets. And there was this notepad, like um, a hotel would have, of people signing about their experiences. So I was reading through this, just going, what is this? And without knowing quite what I was looking at, I just decided to sign it. Thank you. And that was like my note that I laid in there. I took a little felt centipede that somebody had left and I took it with me and then I put the box away. And it reminded me of experiences as a child when you go into the forest and discover something mysterious. Uh, eventually I learned it, it's, it's something called a geocache, which is something that people leave in the woods and you can use the, use the coordinates to find it and leave things or add things. This is a geocache. Oh, <laughs> I finally have an explanation of some nerdy internet stuff. I was kind of hoping it was just the box someone left, but that's still cool. The internet is beautiful. And I went up and, and looked out over the woods and I know the battery was dying. And I realized, okay, the story is over. You know, this is just for me now. You forget until you're here. What it is. Let's look at me while it's over. Battery exhausted. <laughs> Time to go home. And I let myself let go of performing for my friends and then performing for the camera. And then I just sat there free and alone in, a, in appreciation of everything. And then I went back and, and met up with Oliver. Pretty much everything. And I was just exploring this thing, man. I would love doing that, just seeing what's out there, talking to it, hanging out with it. But I feel like I've just been crying. Hours. Maybe. Really? Time doesn't really make sense anymore. You're Oliver, man. Like, I can't even come up with words to describe it. It's just you're Oliver. <laughs> like, that says it all. <laughs> We had this great bonding moment. We just talked about what we had gone through and what we'd experienced. And then Michaela showed up and we had all converged in this one spot without planning it. It just sort of happened. You still have my phone, right? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and then we all went down and I showed them the spot where I was sitting by the lake. And that was when the trip started to kind of wind down. Although trying to explain to them what I was going through by the lake definitely re-triggered some, some tears and some feelings. And it was very comforting to have Michaela there. She kind of just understood what I was going through and held me for a little bit. And then there was this dog <laughs> that ran up to us. And this dog was the best dog at fetch that I'd ever seen. Like, he ran up to us, dropped the stick. Oh, you want me to do something with this? Hey. Right on. How about more challenging? Oh, oh, oh. Can you get it? Ha <laughs> ha
Oh, he shot that back up at me. All right, he's like, what's up, bigger. All right, bigger. We threw it in the lake and it went swimming and got it, came back, it was kind of amazing. And that sort of brought the mood back up, I guess, that sort of got us back to that euphoric, we're all here having fun sort of thing. And then they left me again, you know, I was barefoot, so I was a little slower, and they went up ahead because they were cold. And um, when they left, I had another moment walking up the hill, seeing a purple sunset over this beautiful mountain peak. I've never seen anything like it. And I got an overwhelming sense that our story was complete. I think we got an end to this documentary. Kevin opened up his doors to me. Jeff Hunt opened up his doors to us. ABC7 News opened up their doors to us. Oh yeah, team friendship for life. And <laughs> we got to see Telluride. Team friendship for life. Just about everybody we've asked to share their story has been so open and agreeable and I just feel honored that they've educated us. This is just the beginning. We're team friendship. Nice to meet you. I'm gonna be around for a while. <laughs> no, this would have happened without team friendship. Team friendship. For life. <laughs> for life. substance abuse like a, a health issue instead of a criminal issue, then I think we could redirect our energy in the places that need it the most. All right, second time's a charm. Uh, when I was 21 years old, I had already eaten mushrooms a handful of times. I started eating mushrooms when I was 15. 
nothing but positive, amazing, mind-expanding experiences. So I went online and discovered that you could purchase spores and the means to grow psychedelic mushrooms. So I ordered the spores, which were completely legal to order in Pennsylvania, and I started cultivating. And I had left my cultures to go to a baby christening in West Virginia. And on the way back, I was pulled over and illegally searched by Maryland State Troopers. They found a little bit of cannabis on me and a bunch of pipes. They radioed ahead to the local authorities where I lived and they uh, served a warrant on my house before I was ever released from custody in Maryland. And when they uh, served the warrant on my premises, they found cultures, no mushrooms. And they took those cultures to a forensic chemist. Three weeks later, they charged me with criminal attempt to manufacture a controlled substance. In the court of public opinion, that doesn't look too good. And the district attorney said that I was growing poison that could kill and that there was no way that they were for therapeutic value. The felony sent into motion a chain of events that landed me back in jail. And I ended up in maximum security, which was ridiculously uh, physically dangerous. And I was exposed to hepatitis C and MRSA. And yeah, for a, for a drug possession, I think that's kind of ridiculous. Because you, once you have that experience, you're never the same. And the prison system isn't meant to rehabilitate, which really sucks. I'll ask you one more question. I'm sort of embarrassed about this, but I have to be a journalist. Okay. And uh, I was talking to, what's his name over at Rooster? Riley. Riley. I was talking to Riley and he mentioned people who've gotten shook, who end up in sort of an abstract place and uh, maybe lose connection with reality as we all know it. And I said, is it possible that Travis has been shook? <laughs> they call that like spun, spun out. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you're like in this abstract world and you can't make sense of it. It's like why integration is so important. It's like you've just experienced something that's so foreign to you that you talk to somebody that has experienced it and they can give you the, the means to navigate that. And I think that sometimes if you go too deep without coming back to touch base, that you lose that relativity to reality or our consensus. And then you, know, you, are, you might as well be insane to the rest of everybody. Do you think you're spun? I mean, I, that, that's, a, that's a very narrow yes or no question. I do, but I don't, because I'm, it's like a point of relativity. If someone's like observing me, like I would say that they could make that commentary, but I really feel like I found my solidarity in this space. So I don't feel like, like I'm in water that's too deep. You know, like my feet are touching the ground somewhere. There's still the means to be an active participant in society, but still have abstract thought but you need to realize that they're all part of a big continuity. And sometimes we could just get trapped in the compartments of one or the other. Like, look at, look at people that are, you know, trapped with rigid paradigms. Like, they don't, it's like the allegory of the cave. Like, they have no idea how expansive and infinite the world really is because they're too wrapped up in their student debt and trying to figure out if God exists. And, you know, like thinking that a 401k is the means to which, you know, like eldership is achieved. So that's spun in a way, you know, like, like uh, our object fetishism, you know, some cultures would say is a mental illness. So like, it's all a matter of where you're at looking at something. Did I answer the question? I think so. Okay. information came up for both of you is because it's your own wisdom. Okay, we can talk yeah. about this later. Yeah. You got a meeting to go to. I got a meeting to go to. <laughs> Oh, 
see you. Yeah. What, what would your parents think if you're late to City Hall? What's up, Oliver? What's up, man? <laughs> yeah, I, at least I gave him a call to let him know. Okay. You know? Yeah. So you're good. Yeah. It's okay. We're good. <laughs> We're good. It's okay to be late. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Devin. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Thank you. <laughs> Bunch of degenerates. After this meeting today, now we can really start sharing that the city's cooperating with us and we're collaborating on, on these public service announcements. And we now have a direct access to the city to start seeing what's possible for the future. We're working on the education process so that we don't have those subsequent effects later on down the road. I would love to see a billboard that says mushrooms are still illegal, yeah. use them safely, don't drive under the influence, mm -hmm. and here's a, here's a link to a resource. You know, during the campaign, of course, you know, the opposition made it very clear that their concerns were about driving under the influence and, and you know, um, you know, risky access for minors and things like that. But at the very least, the data shows that those really aren't risks. What other gray areas are there? I know we mentioned it's decriminalized. That doesn't mean legalized. Right. So if somebody is gifting mushrooms or selling mushrooms, that's still illegal, right? Yeah, if someone is allowed to cultivate mushrooms in their own home. They are allowed to consume them themselves. Uh, as long as it's a personal possession amount and you're not being paid for it, you probably can share it with a friend. Now, another thing Jeff brought up was he said he would be more convinced if this went through FDA channels. Is there a possibility of that happening? Well, it is currently going through FDA channels now. Really? Um, yeah, in October of 2018, the FDA granted breakthrough therapy status to psilocybin. Um, for the treatment of major depression or treatment resistant depression. We already have the federal government talking about this and, and recognizing it as a potential legal um, legal medicine that can be prescribed to patients. Yeah, you're gonna follow this till the end, it sounds like. 100%, mm -hmm. 100%. I have to, I, 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 don't have to, I want to. To me, this is a calling for the rest of my life. Yeah. Because where we're at right now and the potential for where it's going to be in 10, 20, 30 years, yeah. that, that's a career and it, it knocks on your door. We gotta do that. But wait, then there's Oliver! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>of these plants, we co-evolved together and their potency and their message comes from thousands of years of co-evolution co with humans. And now more than ever we need that message that they bring because we have climate change, we have the growth of authoritarian governments, capitalism hasn't solved all of our problems. It's created abundance, but it's also created hoarding and it's also created poverty and it's also created trauma and depression and all these things that we haven't quite figured out how to solve through the capitalist model. They offer us solutions that capitalism can't offer us. Whatever happens, if people go towards commodification, corporatization, profiteering, uh, that we must always collectively protect the rights of all people to have access to these plants and fungi. There is this understanding of ayahuasca being a teacher plant, although teacher isn't technically the appropriate term because that's still a Western idea, right? You're teaching something. It's a, I think the, the real is a plant that offers knowledge. So it's not teaching, but it's offering knowledge. Like here's this knowledge, you can do with it what you will, right? There's a lot of people out there who say maybe we're moving too fast or we don't have enough research or these types of things. That's a wrong way to look at it because there's millennia of tradition. You know, doctors have been looking at it for 50 years and they don't know enough about it. But it doesn't mean that people don't know about enough about it or that hasn't been being worked with for a really long time. And all of those traditions seem to speak to this other realm, this sacred realm. We're, we're certainly not advocating that the for-profit corporate 
interests are the ones driving this, particularly pharmaceuticals, uh, which is why we're uh, advocating for decriminalization and equitable access for all. We think the best approach is people producing their own medicine or trading within collectives. Beyond that, uh, we hope that our governments would regulate uh, any kind of productivity of uh, taking these plants and uh, combining them with other compounds. Sounds like you and Jeff Hunt and the Centennial Institute might actually agree more than you think. As long as he supports uh, full decriminalization for all people to have equitable access and to grow their own and share their own and gift their own, then maybe we're on the same side. He's not quite there yet, but I, I could right. see an opening. <laughs>